Hello, everyone, and welcome to Geopolitical Intelligence Services webinar on Global Hotspots 2024. I'm GIS Managing Editor Andrew Curth. I'll be your host today. And I'm joined by GIS expert Peter, Dr. Peter Brooks. Dr. Brooks is a veteran national security policymaker and analyst, uh, having served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, a Capitol Hill staffer, a State Department officer, and a Naval, naval officer, among, I think, uh, several other things. So, Dr. Brooks, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, before we get started, uh, I want to let our audience know that we welcome your questions. Uh, we'll save some time at the end uh, to put those to Dr. Brooks. So just write them in the com comments section that you see below the video, and we'll choose some of those and we'll pick the best, best ones and we'll, we'll put them to Dr. Brooks uh, during, during the, the webinar here. Um, with that said, I want to jump right in. Now, <laughs> There's no shortage of anxiety about uh, the year 2024. Already, we've got several major conflicts raging, uh, including in, in Ukraine and the Middle East. There's no sign of those abating. Uh, and then there's the, the presidential election in the United States, among many elections that are happening this year, but the, the one in the United States probably being uh, yeah. the most watched and certainly the most important. Uh, and it promises to be extremely, extremely uh, contentious. Um, so. For decisions out, decision makers out there, um, it's it's crucial to know what to watch for. Um, so we're going to try and make sense of it uh, here today. Uh, Dr. Brooks just on Friday uh, wrote, or we published a report by Dr. Brooks just on Friday um, uh, called "Instability 2024: Hotspots and Flashpoints to Watch." Um, and so what I want to do today is ask him about the conclusions he comes to in those. Uh, in, in, in that report and kind of maybe dive a little bit deeper and see if we can't come to some conclusions ourselves about, uh, about what we can, we can look out for. So, uh, Dr. Brooks, uh, thanks again for being here. And um, I guess the first thing I want to ask is, I don't know, to me and, and I think to a lot of the people I talk to, it seems like the world is... is getting more unstable. Disruptive events seem to be happening more and more often. We, we're seeing conflicts pop up in places that we didn't expect them before. In Europe, which was had been stable since since the 90s, you know, in, in, in the Middle East, where for 20 years the Palestinian conflict wasn't really an issue that we had to worry about. Is instil instability the new normal? I think it's true for history. Mm. Uh, in general, the fact is, is that instability is very common. In fact, when I start lectures like this, I often remind people of the words of uh, Dean Acheson, who was Harry Truman's uh, Secretary of, of State, who when asked by a reporter uh, how he defined foreign policy, uh, he looked at the reporter and said, foreign policy is just one darn thing after another. So, and I, I think that's true. And I'm also reminded of, of Mark Twain, who said that, a Amer famous American writer, who said that, uh, well, history doesn't repeat itself, it often rhymes. And we're always challenged by these things that we cannot always predict. Think about the pandemic, for instance. Right. I mean, you know, we knew that that was a possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, we knew about the, the, the Black Plague. We knew about the 1918 Spanish influenza. But yet it still happened. So I think instability is something we're, we're dealing with. And I don't want to be too dramatic. We have significant challenges ahead of us, policymakers, business leaders, um, others, you know, in terms of the international landscape today. Uh, and it's so dynamic. I mean, I wrote this piece for you. I didn't just write it on Thursday, right? right. I, wrote it, I wrote it before that, and then Friday, and then all these, all these things have happened in the days in the days since. And in fact, since we talked last week, I think one of my answers to the question you had posed to me then has changed uh, because things are so dynamic. For instance, I mean, over the weekend, Iran took uh, missile shots at uh, into Iraq, yeah. into Syria into Pakistan, right? Uh, you know, and of course, then we've seen all of this stuff going on in, in the Red Sea. So tremendous challenges ahead of us. Um, and but I think it's I, I want to say that greater instability is um, the new normal. I think it's something that's part of history and will be part of current events and part of, of the future. So we have to understand them and we have to be able to respond to them and react to them, or if we can't even proactively prevent them. 
So those are the big challenges. I mean, leaders today are in Davos, right? Um, you know, talking about these things. Uh, you know, there'll be a lot of discussions. I haven't had a full readout on Davos yet, but you know, these are things that are going to be that are going to be talked about, and people are getting together to uh, to deal with it. We had recent climate summits, so there are, the diplomats and and business folks are going to be very very busy for the I think in the in the coming. Years. You know, you brought up the Middle East, which is where a lot of eyes are right now uh, for good reason. And that was one of the spots that you mentioned in your report. You also mentioned Russia, Ukraine, Taiwan, the Korean Peninsula. But is in your estimation of, of, of those areas of the hotspots, is, is the Middle East the one that we have to kind of be the most careful about now? Is that the one that's most likely to give us uh, to, to, to cause some sort of catac cataclysmic change? Well, you know, I, I think when last week when we talked, I thought I was more concerned about Ukraine. Mm. Uh, but I, I think today I'm more concerned about the Middle East because of developments, just some of them that I mentioned. Uh, the U.S. involvement in strikes uh, on the Houthi rebels, uh, the Houthi rebels not backing down. Uh, the fact that we, you know, there's still Hezbollah still has a lot of resources it could unleash under on, on Israel. Um, Iran has been firing missiles pretty in different directions, surprisingly. Think about that, a shot across uh, international borders into, into Pakistan. Right. You might not be too surprised by Iraq right. or Syria, considering the, the recent history there, but into, into Pakistan. Could you explain uh, that you know, for our so audience for a minute? Why, why, why would it be less... Uh, why would it be less surprising for uh, Iran to to shoot missiles into Iraq or Syria, but less so, uh, more surprising for for Pakistan? Could you could you just uh, explain that for a minute? Well, sure, because of recent history, um, you know, it, it, one of it, one of the things. Let me take break it down here quickly. Of course, you know, Iran has been deeply involved in Syria since the civil war started. Absolutely. It's still there mm -hmm. today, right? Um, so there's still there's still issues there. We recently had a major explosion at the funeral of uh, Soleimani, right? That came that ISIS claimed, but now but the, the Iranians uh, also are worried about groups operating out of Syria and Iraq that may have been may have been involved here. So it's you know it's a very tough neighborhood. Um, you know the, the fact is is that the the Iranians are in terms about Iraq. Iranians are concerned about uh, Kurdish separatism. Uh, in, in Iran. The Kurds are a major minority in, in Iran. A lot of people don't talk about that, but Iran has a number of small, uh, or not small, but minorities uh, that, that live in, within, within that country. Uh, in fact, I think I heard once that the Persians are about just a little bit more than 50%. So you have Bulich, you have, have Kurds and others, and there's worried about separatism and, and violence as well. So I'm not, Iran had all of these, you know, reasons for why they did. They said that, you know, that in in Kurdistan, that that the uh, they were going after an is Israeli intelligence facility. Right. Um, you know, they, they talked to Pakistan. They have you know they're a bullish in Pakistan as well. Uh, they've had a, a tense uh, you know a tense relationship um, you know for for many years that it can occasionally go on on the boil. So yeah, this is this was kind of this was kind of surprising when you think about it. Them just lobbing these missiles uh, into them, and it should, Iran, I should also mention, has the largest ballistic missile. Arsenal in the Middle East has the largest, um, and, and it's very extremely capable. Um, so you know, it's it's um, this is something we need to be very concerned about. You could see a strike into Syria in support of the Syrian regime against the potential terrorist groups, uh, you know, ISIS, things like that. Um, I I'm not justifying these at all, right? Uh, but I'm I'm just pointing out the fact that this is what they be heard. Then there's been tensions between. Uh, you know, the Kurds and the Iranians for the Iraqi Kurds and Iranians for for many years. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it just it's the whole region is uh, is on the boil. And what do you think would have to happen for the U United States to get involved? Well, we are involved, right? Um, of course. In, in many ways, in, already. Right. <clears throat> the United States has global interests, right? Uh, and we have significant interests in, in the Middle East. Uh, we're a close ally of, of Israel, for instance, right? Um, you know, very concerned about what's happening in, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, the United States has been a supporter of the, the two-state solution. Um, you know, there's the, there's the Palestinians in the, in, the, uh, in the West Bank. There's humanitarian concerns. There's the fighting that's going on. There's the American nationals who live in, in that part of the world, in, including in Israel and in, and in Gaza. 
Um, you know, we're um, obviously we we surged some forces to that part of the world. Uh, initially, I think a lot of those have drawn back, and they may be be redirected uh, towards the towards the Red Sea. Now we're seeing what's going on in the Red Sea, where they're not only they're firing at U.S. warships, they're firing at U.S. flagships, uh, they're firing at other international commerce. Uh, the Red Sea is a critically important waterway, uh, as I'm sure our audience knows. I mean, if you have to go around the point of Africa, it's another 3,000 miles. That adds to insurance costs, that adds to, you know, that adds to fuel costs, transportation costs. So this is, the United States is already involved. I don't think we're looking to, uh, you know, put boots on the ground, although we do have boots on the ground in, in small numbers around the Middle East. Um, but I, I think that we are definitely very, very involved. And once again, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not speaking. These are all private comments. I'm not speaking for GIS and I'm not speaking for the U.S. government. I'm not speaking for the American people. <clears throat> I'm just speaking for myself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my own my own opinions. But, yeah, we are we are heavily involved. We're worried about energy security. Uh, you know, we're worried about there's uh, so many things that uh, we're and of course, in a, a larger Middle East war is of, of tremendous uh, concern. There are other players that can play play a role. There. Well, speaking of which, uh, Israel is already involved in a, in a uh, very big conflict uh, against right. against Hamas in the Gaza Strip. And um, well, people are always worried about uh, potential war uh, between Israel and Iran. And one of the things that you mentioned in your report is Iran's nuclear program, which is something that Israel is, of right. course, very, very worried about. Could you talk a minute about that, about, about Iran's nuclear program, where we stand with that and how big the risk is there? Well, that's a tremendous concern. Uh, you know, obviously, there's a worry that Iran's nuclear program isn't just for peaceful energy purposes, um, that it's for more than that, that there's a military dimension that they're actually involved in a nuclear weapons program. And I think there's enough evidence out there, both from uh, Western intelligence agencies and things that the Israelis have been able to um, procure uh, or to to get a hold of that uh, show that Iran did have a nuclear weapons program into the early 2000s. Um, we should also mention that Iran has, you know, been involved covertly and overtly in a nuclear program for many, many years, originally for nuclear power. And then there were concerns about it in terms of uh, developing a nuclear, a nuclear weapon. Um, so this is something that I think that these, I can't speak to the Israelis, certainly, but I think they've said it enough that they consider it to be an existential threat uh, to, to Israel. Um, I think that also because of the rivalries in, in the Middle East between uh, Arab and Persians and Sunnis and Arab and Sunnis and Shia, um, that you know, people are very, very concerned about Iran having a nuclear weapon and what that would do to the balance of power in the in the region. Um, there was an agreement, as we remember, um, back in 2015, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, that included the uh, P5 plus one, the permanent five nuclear powers plus EU slash Germany and Iran. Uh, that tried to limit Iran's nuclear program. Uh, the Trump administration uh, pulled out of that uh, that deal because of concerns of its shortcomings, and it did have shortcomings. There was no question question about that. Uh, and Iran has since then uh, continued uh, to uh, violate the the agreement. Um, has been stockpiling uh, uranium uh, that it could enrich to a point where it could be used in, used in a weapon. In fact. Uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is still monitoring an, Iran's program to a certain extent. The Iranians have uh, pulled back and, and have uh, the access of these, uh, these inspectors, says that Iran has enough low enriched uranium right now that could be turned into high enriched uranium for a bomb uh, in short order uh, in perhaps a couple of weeks. Uh, and it may be as much as much for as enough uranium for three weapons. So that's something of tremendous concern, I think, not only to the countries of the Middle East, certainly, certainly Israel, but the United States, because one of the other things I mentioned before, Iran has the largest ballistic mm. missile arsenal in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, now, Iran, but it's kind of limited to the Middle East, Southern Europe, and then, of course, South Asia. Okay. Uh, but uh, they are also working on a, a space program uh, that would, um, that perhaps could push that uh, you know, regional ballistic missile program to one with intercontinental uh, ballistic missile range. That's really, really, uh, 
really interesting. We've we've got already we're already getting uh, lots of questions from our uh, from our audience and a couple on Iran, the Middle East. So I'd like to kind of uh, go ahead and and put those to you. Um, one uh, one uh, audience member asks: uh, As the U.S. ramps up activity against Iran's proxies in the axis of resistance, what is the likelihood of conventional military conflict, and where would it most likely occur? So we address that a little bit, um, but I don't know. Do you see a likelihood? How, how likely is conventional military conflict with with Iran? It's certainly possible. I think there's a, there's a number of, of potential scenarios, unfortunately, but war is never inevitable in right. my view. Okay, I, I mean it, it's it's something we want to avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, we know the tremendous costs, the humanitarian costs, the economic costs, the political costs of war. So what we really want to do is to avoid it. And of course, the United Nations was set up to to do this. It hasn't always mm -hmm. been the most effective about it. But that was the whole idea after World War II and the devastation of World War II that we were going we were gonna try to, to prevent these sort of things from happening. Um, and unfortunately, humankind has not been that successful with it. But yeah, there, there are many pathways to a greater conflagration in that part of the world. Some of them I could address and perhaps throw out there, and some we probably can't even conceive of it, you know, right today. But certainly. You know, this there could be a wider war involving Hezbollah. They have a lot of resources in, in southern oh. in southern Lebanon. Can, if I could they just could interrupt certainly... you right there, because we have a, we have another question. We have a question on Hezbollah oh. exactly, and it, it's what do you gauge would be the triggers for a significant increase in the involvement of Hezbollah in in a kinetic capacity targeting Israel? So we know that Hezbollah has targeted Israel in a sort of limited fashion so far, and they've kind of gone back and forth in this very limited limited way. Um, what mm -hmm. would you see for a, as a trigger for a significant increase is the question. I think Iran would have to probably give acquiescence to that. Mm. Um, you know, Hezbollah is, is very capable on its own, uh, probably the most capable, what we, we call a foreign terrorist organization here in the United States. I know not everybody has Hezbollah on that listing, but I consider them to be a terrorist organization. A lot of capabilities, um, very capable in many, many ways, but they also get their support from Iran. Now, I, I don't think Iran wants a fight with Israel or the United States. Mm. Um, I think they want to uh, protect and advance their interests without war. So, and there's a famous Persian proverb that somebody's probably out there a better scholar about this than I am, but they talk about it, you know, it, using another's hand to catch the snake, mm -hmm. okay? Iran has been par excellence in using proxies. And we always talk about, you know, all of their allies, you know, Hamas, mm -hmm. right? You know, we're all wondering what Iran knew about what Hamas was going to do, right, in Israel in October. Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Houthis, which look like are going to go back on the U.S. foreign terrorism list shortly. Um, they were, they, the Trump administration put them on, the, um, uh, the Biden administration took them off, and it looks like they may go back on. But they use all of these sort of proxies and try to stay away from it, it direct involvement if they if they can. Um, so I think that Israel and, and Iran don't want this. I think the nuclear program is one thing that would certainly cause uh, an international crisis that could lead to military confrontation. I think Israel will do what it needs to do, regardless of what is going on in Gaza, to deal with the Iranian nuclear program. Because there's not only concerns about Iran having it. But would they share it with somebody else? Mm -hmm. What would they share it with a terrorist organization? Now, I, I, we'd like to think that no, no, but no, no sovereign state would ever do that. But we don't know that, right? It's you know, we talked. Remember during the 9/11 years, we talked about super terrorism, right? The idea that terrorist groups, including Al Qaeda, were trying to get their hands on weapons of mass destruction, and that was a big, big concern. So yeah, I think you know the nuclear issue is certainly something that would, would cause a significant a significant uh, chance for that to happen. But I think that I think Hezbollah is probably, you know, it will be costly to them to fight Israel as well. Israel is very very capable. I, I see the United States supporting Israel, but I don't see any direct involvement by the United States um, right right now. Uh, the United States has a lot of things going on, and and the fact of the matter is is that among senior policymakers, think of you know, there's only so many crises you can handle at once. Right. I mean, it's true. I mean, you think about, you know, the Secretary of State, <laughs> U.S. Secretary or a foreign minister, whatever. And if you have all these crises going on, how do you pay the appropriate attention to them? Now, you have a lot of great 
super, you know, people below you who are doing assistant secretaries and undersecretaries and doing things like that. But too many crises is difficult for any administration, any administration to handle. And of course, at the same time, I realize I'm, I'm rambling here, but no, I think, yeah. of course, at the same time, you know, they're they're also worried about the things that haven't happened yet. Yeah. Like China, Taiwan, which yeah. we haven't talked about, and the election just recently in Taiwan, or the Korean Peninsula. The North Koreans are talking about changing their, uh, talking about changing their constitution, saying that they're no longer interested interested in unification. Right. I mean, they're really they're hard. We don't have a good sense of North Korean leadership. I mean, it's just very, very difficult. Right. It's a, uh, a very, very difficult society to penetrate diplomatically or, or otherwise. So, what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say here is is I really can't. Um, I really can't predict what it would be, but I think that Hezbollah's reins are being held by Iran, and Iran would have to see it as advancing their their interests in, in that in that part of the world. Oh, that's that's a point very very well taken. So so thank you for that, and and the explanation was was absolutely uh, very important and and, and clear. Uh, but actually, yeah, exactly. Speaking of all of those other crises, let's let's try and, and get to a couple others uh, okay. uh, around around the world. The, the Middle East, we, we could spend a whole webinar on it, I, I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you probably should. And we, and we may. And we may yet this, this year. So audience, stay tuned to GIS. We'll, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, but uh, w there was one hot spot of, the, of those others that you just mentioned that we haven't mentioned yet and that I would like to get to because we have a question from the audience that is kind of adjacent to it. So I would like to okay. just quickly um, talk about the Russia-Ukraine conflict, Russia's, Russia's war of right. aggression against, against Ukraine. And maybe if you could tell me a little bit how you see that conflict. We've got kind of like a stalemate now where it's kind of generally agreed that Russia has the upper hand just kind of because it's on the defense. Um, and yeah, how do you see that going? Is there a, a chance for a breakthrough or, or, or an escalation? Um, how do you see it? Yeah. Yeah, I can see all the thoughts kind of spinning around in your head. Absolutely. There, there's so many things. It's, you know, it's very complex. It's very, it's very intricate. It's very dynamic. I mean, you know, uh, you know, we have a very cold day here in Washington. It's like 10 degrees, which is like minus 12 Celsius. So it's very, very cold. It's unusual for us. And so we're, we're made aware of, of winter here in Washington. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we see what's, you know, we understand that in that part of, of Central Europe where Ukraine-Russia conflict is going on, that winter is there. And we're all remember our history of Napoleon and, and Nazi Germany and stuff like that coming up against the Russian uh, winter, but we're also thinking that now the winter is also affecting the Russians too. Um, so, in you know, in some ways, for in that part of the world, a winter is good because the ground gets hard and armor can move much easier, mm -hmm. rather than in some of the other seasons where it's it's kind of boggy. Um, so that could be a thing. But the Russians have lost a lot of equipment, right? Yeah. The Ukrainians continue to surprise us, in my view. Um, I, you know, I was. Um, and they continued, I mean, the shooting down of a number of advanced aircraft yeah. the, the other day with weapons they haven't even discussed with us yet. Their use of drones, things like that. What I see probably is uh, if I had to if I had to give you an answer, uh, because <laughs> it's so dynamic. But my sense is, is that this is a critical year in this conflict. OK, uh, Ukraine uh, and Zelensky is in Davos, by the way. So, I mean, he's talking to people. He's going to meet with, you know, just about everybody, I'm sure, while he's there. Um, but Ukraine needs international support. Um, very capable. Um, they've, they've proved to be more capable militarily than, than we thought. They're very innovative with the, the way they're defending themselves. They're, they're truly behind the cause, which I, is incredible. But the Russians are going to make it very difficult for them this winter, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to go after infrastructure. They're going to turn off the power, turn off the heat. So there are real challenges. So I think a lot of it is tied into Zelensky's ability to garner international support. Right. Now, I, I believe as an American, my view is, is that we need to support Ukraine. Uh, there's no question in my mind about that because I worry about the... Um, there's, a, there's another saying about where something's uh, appetite grows with the eating. Mm -hmm. And I'm worried that if, if Russia is able to uh, take more territory or even all of Ukraine, that that's only the beginning of the problems we're going to have with Russia based on the ideology and the viewpoint of, of, of Vladimir Putin. 
So I'm really, really concerned about it. But go ahead. You want to ask me something? Well, yeah. I, the, the question that our viewer uh, had was actually about Belarus and the change of nuclear doctrine okay. there. Because we know yes. that uh, Russia moved some nuclear weapons uh, into, into Belarus or yes. allegedly did. Uh, yep. um, so yep. Yep. can you talk a little bit about that and the dangers that poses? Right. Well, I actually wrote about that for you guys a couple of months ago. So they can they can look at look at that. Uh, but that was a couple of months ago. Sure. I'm, I'm kind of confused by this whole thing. I'm not confused. Uh, you know, the Russians are doing this for a couple of reasons. One is that they really are like nuclear saber rattling. And that's where they have a, a you know, a significant um, capability that people are worried about. Uh, it's very much it's not, it's, you know, symmetric with the United States, but it's asymmetric with others. Right. Like Ukraine doesn't have nuclear weapons. Right. So I think that they're they're showing this is the first time the Russians have um, deployed nuclear weapons outside of uh, Russia or the Soviet Union or since the Soviet Union. So it is significant in that way. Um, I think Belarus is very closely hewed to to Russia and Lukashenko and Putin are very closely, uh, closely aligned. But I don't believe I think the most important thing is, and I do believe the transfers have taken place. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we've seen enough coming out in the open uh, space, the open source uh, from the government saying that this transfer has taken place. And these are tactical nuclear weapons mm -hmm. with re uh, that will be put on regional uh, mm -hmm. missiles, such as the Iskander. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe they're under the control of the Belarusian army, right. the Belarusian military, or Lukashenko. I, I don't believe that. I think that they belong to the Russians. Mm -hmm. uh, they provide deterrence for, for Belarus. They show that Putin has friends, uh, considering how politically he how uh, politically isolated he is uh, mm -hmm. due to this due to this war. I think that he also it's a is a pushback on NATO because the U.S. has some tactical nuclear weapons in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have some in the United States and then we have some in Europe. And I think they're saying, well, if you can do it, so can we so we can deploy them there. Um, it, it also is going to worry Kiev. Right. Uh, because, you know, that could become it has been a front as part of this war, but not a major front. Mm -hmm. So it could become a more. Uh, challenging front for for Kiev, which is really concentrating on the on the southeast. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's there, this is something. But I do not believe that the Russians have given the permissive action links, which are these are the things that allow you to uh, launch a nuclear weapon mm -hmm. uh, to the Belarusians. Mm -hmm. I just I just don't believe it. I could be wrong, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. Um, and, but I think that they're probably there. And I think that Lukashenko is using this for propaganda purposes mm -hmm. um, to, to make people think that he has control of these weapons when he really doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's basically a ploy mm -hmm. to increase the importance of, of Belarus, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, internationally, like, well, we're a nuclear power now, but I don't believe they're a nuclear power. Mm -hmm. I think they have Russian nuclear weapons under Russian control on Belarusian territory. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's my view. Yeah. So um, I, I don't, I don't, and this whole thing about changing their doctrine, mm -hmm. I don't think they have, I don't think you have a doctrine if you don't have the weapons. Okay. So like, mm -hmm. with, it's like with North Korea saying, we're no longer interested in reunification with the South. We're going to change our constitution. Is that important or not? Or is it just, is it just, you know, a public uh, relations stunt? Mm -hmm you know, to raise tensions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, Belarus has its, its, its own challenges. Um, so, I, I, like I said, I think there's an internal audience for this yeah. in, in Belarus. And I think there's an external audience in certainly those frontline states uh, in, of NATO that, that, border, that border Belarus. Yeah, so it, it kind of serves both, both sides, the Russians and the Belarusians. They can uh, use it for their own propaganda purposes. Um, can you just right. real quickly, for, for those in our audience who might not know the difference or know what what it means. You mentioned tactical nuclear weapons, right? right. And there's a difference between right. tactical nuclear weapons and strategic nuclear weapons. Could you just tell us what that is and why it's important for Russia and, and, and yeah, give us, give us a little right. background. Well, the, the quick answer is the, the ICBMs, the strategic ones are the big ones and the tactical are the small ones. Right. But in truth, there's no specific definition that defines them. You know, some people say you can actually a tactical nuclear weapon is up to 100 kilotons, which is pretty big. But a lot of people talk about them being as small as one kiloton. Mm -hmm. So but there's no specific definition, but just kind of for a rough order of magnitude. That's what people kind of talk about. But the purpose of a tactical nuclear weapon is that it's meant to be used on the battlefield. And they're also called battlefield nuclear weapons. So they're not meant to be strategic. To They're not city busters. 
they're not to take out large uh, senses of population, you know, large military bases. And the ICBMs, the strategic ones, are what we call like intercontinental ballistic missiles. Those are the ones which, you know, for many years we, you know, we, we were concerned. We still are concerned about it. But I mean, especially during the Cold War, about this major exchange of long-range missiles between the United States and and Russia, um, coming out of silos and other things uh, that would, you know, destroy cities and might destroy you know, mankind uh, or humankind. So, but tactical nuclear weapons were some that would be used that, that could be used to, um, you know, perhaps uh, take out a take out a port, or to take out a major military um, mobilization or a major military uh, grouping. Um, it could be used against the, you know, it could be used against a small city. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there, there, these, these were these were things that were talked about during the during the Cold War, and they were also part of the escalation chain. Okay, right. so it's like. Um, you know, it's like, I guess, a, a bull, uh, you know, a playground fight, if, if I might, you know, you know, somebody mm-hmm. might says a word to somebody and somebody says something back and then somebody pushes somebody right. and then somebody pushes back and then all of a sudden fists are flying. Right? right. So there's that escalation. So, you know, you could start with a conventional war and then you could move to tactical nuclear weapons before going to the strategic nuclear weapons and tactical nuclear weapons were used regionally. So say, say like in Western Europe we were, or in Europe, we were talking about Russia and NATO during the Cold War. They're still around. Mm-hmm. They're still around. They still exist, um, and the Russians have threatened to uh, to use them. And those are the ones they've moved to to Belarus. Um, and there's concerns they could do a lot of things to to uh, uh, to saber rattle, to influence policy uh, of not only of Kiev, uh, but also of Kiev supporters. So it, it is it is important, and I, I don't think the chance of it happening is zero. I think it's low, but I don't think it's zero. Great. Sorry, it could be a game yeah. changer. It, you have to remember, you have to, you know, we talk about in foreign policy all the time, mirror imaging. It's like, this is what I would do, right? But I'm not the Russian president, okay? Right. So we have to try to get inside the head of the right. Russian president. Yeah. Um, and that's very, very difficult, um, especially somebody from another culture. So, you know, here we're saying, um, you know, would Putin do this? Well, D- Dmitry Medvedev the other day said, once again, raise the nuclear yeah. specter. So they're trying yeah. to have influence in yeah. Kiev. They're trying to have influence in, in, in you know, Western Europe and uh, in the United States. So I think, I think it's a low risk because I don't think they want to break that 75 year old taboo of not having used a weapon mm-hmm. in, in anger. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't, think the, I don't think it's zero because they could see it as a, they, Russia could see it as a game changer in, in Kiev right. and, and, they, and maybe to get right. Kiev to surrender. Uh, if they were to use one. You know, you know, Dr. Brooks, uh, speaking of getting in a president's head, um, you know, I'm sitting here, <laughs> I'm sitting, I'm sitting here in, in, in Warsaw, uh, where there is a lot of hand wringing uh, about what might happen if, if Donald Trump becomes president. He's been very, um, you know, we, we're, we're not really sure about how he feels about Ukraine, or maybe he's, he's actively um, uh, hostile toward, toward Ukraine. We don't really know um, how, how that would work and, 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 and how he feels mm-hmm. about NATO. Is he hostile uh, to NATO? He sure seems like it. So, um, you know, speaking of the, the U.S. election coming up this year, I mean, should, should those of us in Europe be afraid that, that, that NATO and, and Ukraine could be lost if, if, if Donald Trump becomes president? No, I don't think so, uh, because you have to remember that um of course i don't know what's in donald trump's head today <laughs> obviously and, and he hasn't been nominated as the republican nominee and he mm-hmm. hasn't been elected president mm-hmm. yet either and, and so we you know a lot of things could happen between now and, and and november uh but in terms of american and once again i'm speaking for myself i'm not I, i'm not authorized to speak on behalf of my my fellow americans or the u.s government or anything else sure. um but i think that americans see value in um in these alliances OK, they see value in it. Um, there is one thing that really I want people to understand that I think that is true for Americans is a sense of fairness. And what I mean by that is things like burden sharing. Nothing makes, um, you know, the United States spends a tremendous amount of money overseas. Think about the money that has gone to Ukraine that could be going to things here in the United States. Um, you know, schools education, you know, I mean, all sorts of things, fixing roads. I mean, like any government, right? The pie is only so big. We have significant debt. So I think, and I, and I, you know, I know you're an American, so you could probably disagree with me if you wish, but 
you know, like what I'm saying is I think it's a sense of fairness and burden sharing is critically important. The United States doesn't want to be looked at as an ATM. Okay. Sure. We have to, we have to, we have to see it as in our interests. And I think regular folks who don't think about these things very much when it comes up to them and they see money going overseas, they want to make sure it's being spent to support American interests. Mm -hmm. But they do see value. They like, for instance, when we talk about, um, I've lost track of this, I'm sorry, but you know, how many, how many countries within NATO are spending their required 2% of GDP on mm -hmm. defense, mm -hmm. right? It's not all of them, no. right? Right. So when this is, when this is happening, you know, is, is, um, you know, is the United States doing more than other countries? Um, you know, we have, we have social needs here too. Uh, we have an economy, we have to raise families, you know, things like that. Sure. So it's, I think it's critically important that people understand that that burden sharing and we're happy to do our part, but, and we're happy, we often do more than our part in my view, Sure. but we also need people to be, be along with us. I mean, some people could say that, I mean, like I said, I'm very hawkish on this, this war in Ukraine. I, I you know, there's a tremendous number of problems with the Russian, Russian aggression and what it might lead to further beyond, beyond Ukraine, despite the, the tremendous humanitarian and other costs. It's already, you know, the war has already cost people on both sides. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but we know, and I, I so I, I believe that, but then others have to feel that the Europeans, because it's a war in their neighborhood, are doing just as much or more to support the Ukrainians in this case. So I think that's one of the things that's a really important test in politics here. So is, is NATO an important alliance to us? Yes, I believe so, yes, critically. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's important, and I think what we're doing in Ukraine is important to prevent Russia from of, of changing, uh, of doing more of what it's doing in Ukraine um, and elsewhere especially in especially in Europe. But yeah, I think it's that's really critically important. Uh, but I think that the Congress also plays a role in foreign policy here. Sure. Uh, we don't know what the Congress congressional makeup will look like. Uh, but I think that those who pay very close attention to foreign affairs see the value of NATO and see the value of our relationship with Japan and South Korea. But there's always this sort of sense. And I think it's just part of human nature that people want folks to do their part. Sure. You know, and I think whether sure. whether we're talking, we have this issue with Japan and South Korea a lot, too. You, we probably, mm -hmm. you probably don't talk about it in Europe very much. And I realize there's people beyond Europe here. But, you know, when we look at, you know, the costs of, of U.S. forces in Japan, you know, and J Japan pays towards that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, we have these negotiations every couple of years to talk about that. And there's, you know, there's a lot of wringing of hands and gnashing of teeth over these negotiations. So this happens not only in Europe, it happens elsewhere. Um, and it happens in any partnership, mm -hmm. right? You know, it happens in your house. It happens sure. in your business relationship. There's this sort of negotiating on and who's going to do what and who should do what. But I think that's that's really an important thing. But I think the, the Americans um, increasingly understand that what happens overseas can affect us here. Mm -hmm. Now, we're getting a long way from that was very easy after the 9-11 for people to understand that. Right. You know, that, you know, something that started in Afghanistan did what it did here in the United States on 9-11. But we're, we're, always, we're 20 years from 9-11, right? right? Yeah. So, you know, that, that we, so this is something that people unfortunately have to relearn and policymakers need to continue um, to r remind people of. Historians need to remind people of these things. Yeah. Like Mark Twain said, yeah. it may not repeat itself, but it might right. rhyme. So you better yeah. be careful and be, and be aware. Um, so, like I said, we're a long way from November, um, but I see America, I would advocate uh, that America continues its uh, transatlantic relationship because I think it's it's very important. And what's happening in Ukraine is very important to American security as well. All right. Thank you for that. That's an uh, excellent answer. Um, I want to move to the other side of the world. I want to talk about uh, Taiwan, which just had an election over the weekend, yeah. um, which many are worried is going to raise tensions now with Beijing. And uh, that the Taiwan Strait now uh, for... Yeah, it seems like it's it's uh, it's going to be a very tense tense area of the world for the next several years. Can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think that that's the case. I'm not very worried about the elections in, in Taiwan. Um, you know, I, I've been uh, I've been to Taiwan many times. I've been to a presidential inauguration a number of years ago. I know. In fact, I know uh, I have, I've lost track of her, but I, I've done business and uh, had uh, done business with, uh, and met with the, the new vice president, you know, I'm of, of that certain age now where, you know, friends, we were all junior 
uh, you know, analysts or congressional staffers or, you know, things along that line, political operatives. And, and, um, and now they're, you know, coming up to that level of, of governance. So I congratulate them on that. On that. Um, but, you know, I think that Taiwan will be very pragmatic. Um, I think the DPP will be very pra pragmatic. Um, the United States sent a delegation of, of uh, smart people over to, to meet with the, the president uh, elect after the, uh, after the election um, to you know, convey U.S. views on things. Uh, we ha I think the United States and Taiwan has a, has a good relationship. So the United States will be able to you know, play a role in, in the, the situation. The, the open question is China, of course, right? Um, you know, China, China sees Taiwan as a province of China. Uh, they, that's, that they will, won't change on that, at least probably not in our lifetime. They think Taiwan is um, part of China and should be part of China um, and should be ruled by the Chinese Communist Party mm -hmm. in Beijing. The Taiwanese don't feel that way. Mm -hmm. They've been having democratic elections since, what, 1996, mm -hmm. I think. Now, uh, that's a long time, yeah. uh, almost 30 years. Um, they've successfully ruled themselves. They're a major economic power, uh, you know, major chip producer. Uh, I think about, you know, probably one of the best in, best in the world. Um, you know, and they, they also have a unique Taiwan identity, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. uh, that they do not necessarily see themselves as part of, of, of China the Chinese and the Chinese Communist Party. And I don't think they want to go under Chinese communist rule. Mm -hmm. So, but I think that President Xi has one of the most, uh, Chinese President Xi has one of the most assertive foreign policies in years. Mm -hmm. I think he sees himself um, alongside um, celebrated Chinese leaders like uh, Deng Xiaoping and Mao Zedong. Mm -hmm. And the, he, his crowning achievement would be to return Taiwan to China. Mm -hmm. I probably shouldn't even say return, but in their view, in the Chinese view, sure. returning yeah. uh, that to China. Um, so I think this is something we need to worry about because legacies are very important. And I think I could even you know sit, go back. I think that you know one of the driving forces for Putin was legacy and nationalism, right? Mm -hmm. So legacy and nationalism can be a very dangerous combination, and I think we see that in China as well. You know, the, the, the growth of Chinese comprehensive national power, especially its military, which is something I've followed for, for many years, is deeply concerning. Um, you know, it's, it's probably not as good as the American capabilities, but it's there's a, as a as a Soviet general once said, there's a certain quality and quantity right. when we were talking about the difference between, a, you know, an M1 tank and a you know, T-72. Mm -hmm. said, well, you, know, you have so many M1s, we have so many T-72. So there's a certain quality and quantity sure. and the Chinese are building up, up, up significantly. Um, there's only, you know, hundred miles across the Taiwan Strait uh, between China uh, and the mainland. Um, and I'm, I'm worried now I, I would stop here for a moment and say, I do not believe China, China wants war. Mm -hmm. They want acquiescence. Mm -hmm. So they're going to do things that we would call coercive diplomacy, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. flying around mm -hmm. a lot of metal in the air, ships around, trying to influence policy within Taiwan. And I'm sure they tried to influence these elections. We just don't have all the, you know, there was probably cyber, it was probably propaganda, you know, all sorts of things that they were doing to try to influence the elections because they really just want Taiwan to acquiesce and come back quietly. They don't want a war. Think about a war in Asia. The United States, world's largest economy, China's the second largest economy, China, Japan, the third largest economy, South Korea, Taiwan, which I think is like the 20th largest economy, Southeast Asia, I mean, this is, you know, North Korea, what would North Korea do? Mm -hmm. Not as an economy, but just militarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's, you know, so many things. Northeast Asia is, is, is also a potential tinderbox. So I don't think China wants that, um, but they're willing to, uh, you know, the rattle sabers and beat their chest, hoping to influence policy in Taiwan and that somebody would come into office and say, yeah, we should, re we should unite with China. We should unite, unite with the People's Republic of China. Uh, they didn't get that this time, but I don't think that the DPP will declare independence. I mean, they have de facto independence. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, I mean, they except for some places like the UN and some other international organizations where they, they um, you know, don't belong or don't have a seat in the in the front row. Um, Taiwan has diplomatic relations with a lot of countries at an unofficial level and official level. I mean, they've lost one. I think Nauru 
just recently changed again to China. Um, but, you know, they, 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 they operate, people travel economically, you know, things like that. So I, I think that I don't expect a, uh, a declaration of, of independence. I ex kind of expect the status quo, but once again, there's always the possibility of a crisis. Well, and, and that's what I want to put to you. One of our uh, viewers asked um, what, you know, China's recent poor economic performance uh, means and, and also the demographic pressures that are going on there. Does that, all of that together, put more pressure on Xi to, for example, uh, make um, some sort of showing to his population uh, that he's, that he's right. a strong Rally leader? Rally around the flag. Right. Rally around the flag like Putin is trying to do in Russia, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, so, yeah, that's that is there's always a concern about that. Um, so, it, the, you know, to try to divert attention from problems at home. And I think it's important for people to realize that even though China is run by the Chinese Communist Party and it's politically repressive, that public opinion counts in China. When you have a situation like a natural disaster uh, in China or a place where something that the government was involved with, a government building, you know, collapses because of an earthquake, they, senior leaders go there because they are concerned about public opinion. There's nothing more concerning to China than something like Tiananmen happening again. Mm -hmm. This is a region, reason that they tamp down religion because they're worried about any organization that might compete with them for, um, for power. Um, so they, they do care about what's happening. And there's all sorts of anecdotes out there about Chinese leaders listening in on chat rooms and seeing what people are really saying about stuff. Because public opinion, even, <coughs> excuse me, public opinion, even in these repressive countries, is, is important because there are a lot more people than there are, is of the government, even though the government may have guns and stuff. So this is not, they don't want that sort of opposition. So they are, they are concerned about it. So he's going to be distracted right now. Mm -hmm. He had the pandemic, um, you know, they did lockdowns. And part of this is because of their lockdowns and the way they dealt with the pandemic. You know, their vaccine wasn't very good. Um, so a lot of people got sick. So then they thought they had to lock down again. It affected the, the economy. There's been some efforts to try to keep concerns about the civilian military fusion in China, which is the anything that happens in government industries can be used to support the military. Mm -hmm. So people are worried about chips and things like that going to China. So right now, um, China has some, does have some demographic and economic issues and the Chinese care about their economy, especially as they become more and more wealthy and more and more reach the middle class to become bigger stakeholders in what the government does. Mm -hmm. So he's got to worry about that. And he, and he's, so, you know, if he were to take on another, uh, challenge such as um, Taiwan, which the U.S. and others might intervene in, and that would make things at home more, more difficult. But the, your, your questioner makes a very good point. Mm -hmm. A leader could decide to divert from that. Mm -hmm. we, you know, sometimes we call that wagging the dog in the United right. States. We try to get something to, that, to divert attention from the problems right. at home. And that, I think this is just part of human nature. So it is possible. But I think that, like, once again, I think the Chinese will continue their coercive diplomacy, but there's always a possibility of a, you know, of a crisis in the, in the Straits. Um, and they don't know what the United States will do because the United States is not required to defend Taiwan. This is very important. A lot of people don't understand this because the press does, re, um, records this incorrectly a lot. We have the Taiwan Relations Act, and I would recommend people take a look at it, but it basically says that you know, we, would be, we want a peaceful resolution to what happens between China and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And we would concede it as a major issue uh, of grave concern to the United States, which makes it sound like we would get involved. But in any treaty, <clears throat> there's always this sort of out in case your partner acts inappropriately. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so if Poland invades Belarus, mm -hmm. you know, we, even though, you know, Article 5 and all of that, Right. You still have an right. option of saying, I'm not going to participate because you started right. this. Right. Now, now, Poland's not going to invade Belarus, but you know what I'm saying. So something sure. you wouldn't expect to happen. Okay. So like if Japan, you know, starts to, to you know, bomb Korea, um, do we have to defend Japan because they made an option? So this is, this is an out in diplomacy sure. in almost all our treaties. There's sure. no immediate trigger, including Article 5. It would, it would be 
a political meeting and then countries would respond according to their own constitutional processes. So the same thing here. So with Taiwan, we said, China, don't do this is a bad idea. We keep ambiguity in this. Right. And part of the deterrence is that strategic ambiguity that China, if you do this, then it's going to be painful for you. And I think China worries about that. Uh, and that's why it's building up its military. So it doesn't have to worry about the United States. Mm -hmm. Nothing. I'll make one point before I forget. We, you, we won't have time to talk about it here, but China's nuclear weapons buildup mm -hmm. is unprecedented. Yeah. And I wrote about this for you guys, too, I think, last summer. Mm -hmm. it, it's unprecedented. It's probably worse now today. Mm -hmm. At some point, I believe that they will move to parity with Russia and the United States. So they will stand on equal footing with us. And so that's another big issue when you talk Absolutely. about getting into a conventional war. The fact that China might have the capability to... Um, you know, have as many nuclear weapons as, as the United States uh, could create that sort of nuclear standoff that might prevent the United States from intervening. So these are things that people are, are thinking about. We won't yeah. get into that today. And people may want to read that report I wrote for you on on, on the website. But uh, that's another huge issue besides a conventional military. Building. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we don't really have time to talk about anything else. And there are several other issues that I wanted to get to today. But as expected, I, I knew we probably wouldn't be able to get to everything today. And, and, that's, and that's okay, because as you mentioned, there are several reports that you've written. Uh, and, and the report that was that was just published on Friday that our viewers can go to and can read more about all the other uh, the other potential hotspots, uh, including the Korean Peninsula, the potential for terrorism uh, this year. And they can go read your other reports. All they have to do is click on your name and they can find your your reports there. So, um, Dr. Brooks, I want to thank I'm you. I'm sorry about yammering on. So I'm sorry about yammering on so much. There's just so many things to cover. We didn't get to North Korea. No. We didn't get to that's great. You know, the reason we do these these webinars is so that our readers can get even more detail than they get in in our uh, in, in our reports. So that's exactly why we do that. So and we'll have more reports throughout the year. So our viewers are uh, uh, encouraged to keep track of our announcements on social media because uh, there will be more coming this year. And, and we'll be we'll be happy to address many of the other issues. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm just going to say one thing. I mean, I've said a lot of things here today. Sure. Uh, and, you know, so predictive in, in certain ways, but I'm always reminded of, of the uh, famous quote of uh, Danish physicist Neil Bohr's who said, prediction is hard, especially if it's about the future. <laughs> so keep, <laughs> keep that in mind. Right. Everything I say today might be overtaken by events tomorrow. Sure. Well, but at least at least our our viewers can make informed decisions and and that's what we're that's what we're trying to provide. So, uh, Dr. Brooks, thank you so so much for for your insight today. It was Happy. really really valuable. Um, and for the the entire GIS team, I want to thank our audience um, and we wish you a great day wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, stay tuned for more webinars from GIS in the future. Have a great day. Goodbye.